Ultra marathon racers are just a different breed. It takes a different mindset. You're on the bicycle for hours and hours at a time. You can take a break, but if you're serious about any kind of record, you gotta stay in the saddle and just keep riding. It takes experience, it takes practice, and it takes a tremendous amount of patience. My real enthusiasm these days is cycling, and not only just cycling, but competitive cycling, racing, long distance endurance type races to raise money for, for great causes. I've tried each summer to ride or race uh, for a particular cause, for a charity, and this year, because I've never done it before, I want to do something for veterans. So the race this year is called Venture for Veterans Colorado Cycling Challenge. And for a great cause, it's called Paws for Purple Hearts. They're a veterans group that uh, raises and trains service dogs by veterans for other veterans. The race this year is across the state of Colorado, starting at the Utah border, ending at the Kansas border, all on Highway 50, which is 468 miles through the mountains, right uh, over the Continental Divide between the ups and the downs, 17,000 plus feet of elevation gain, all kinds of different weather. It's presented to challenge anybody doing it, whether you're an experienced cyclist or not. The UMCA record overall for this race across Colorado is 32 hours and nine minutes. That was set, I'm told, in 1992 by a 28-year-old man, so an old guy like me uh, is going to have a hard time breaking that record, but uh, that was not the first priority for me. That would be great to be able to break that record and say that I did that, but doing this for exposure for this veterans group and to raise some funds for them is much more important. I think the training probably was as big a challenge or bigger than the race itself during the Major League Baseball season, there just isn't a lot of time to train. We're playing every day. We get an average day off every two and a half weeks, so there's no real days off. You can go out and get a long ride in. So you basically eat and sleep, baseball and cycling, that's about it. There was a fair number of other hoops I had to jump through before this thing ever started, and one of those was the media exposure and doing interviews, and which I enjoy doing, and uh, besides the training, there was fundraising, and there's trying to, pr to promote awareness about the event. I thought it was really cool what the Rockies did, allowed Paul's Purple Hearts to kind of have the pregame festivity and throw out that, that first pitch, literally Yoko going the mound and throwing out the first pitch, I thought was awesome. To see that happen and, and hear and see the crowd reaction to Yoko throwing out the first pitch at the Rockies game was pretty cool. I remember setting my alarm for 2.45. <laughs> I thought with the anticipation of the race it would keep me up all night, but I did get a couple hours sleep. We're at the Utah border getting ready to start the race and I'm thinking about logistics, not really thinking about riding in the dark a whole lot. It was, all right, let's just make sure everybody is ready to go here. Logistics are in place and the foul vehicle's ready. All right, I'm going to pray for us, you guys. When you start the race with a prayer, I think you're starting on the right foot, at least in my mind, and that's what we did to begin that race. Okay, so the official start time is 4.20, 4.20 a.m. We had an official horn to officially begin this race, which I thought was pretty cool. It was after that, I just started thinking, all right, just settle in and start pedaling. Calls are going, jump shots away. Yes! Three seconds to go. Time out, Phoenix! 
I've been a broadcaster for a long time. I started out in the NBA in 1991 doing Minnesota Timberwolves games and then I did the Denver Nuggets for 18 seasons so I spent 20 years in the NBA and then 2010 fortunate enough to get a job doing Major League Baseball in my hometown doing the Colorado Rockies so uh, in the market here in Denver for 28 years. I've been married for 32 now with, with two kids ages 25 and, and 18. I grew up in a small town in South Dakota, uh, went to school in Kansas, and have been out here in the Mile High City for a long time. A real defining moment in my life came in uh, July of 1989 when I survived a commercial airline disaster. United Airlines Flight 232 originated in Denver, bound for Chicago. We blew an engine about halfway to Chicago over Sioux City, Iowa. Uh, emergency landing was, was attempted and with so little control of the plane, we hit down and flipped over and broke into pieces and there were 296 people aboard and 112 people died, including almost everybody around me. The crash itself was the beginning for me in this difficult part in my life. I think what was more harmful to me was the, was the after effects of it. I saw a trauma counselor about two weeks after the crash and he said, I want to warn you about what's going to come next. He said, I warn you about post-trauma stress disorder, PTSD. And he said, because of what you went through, the circumstances that you went through, he said to me, I can identify four stages of post-trauma stress that you'll go through. He said, stage one is going to be survivor's guilt. You're going to feel guilty because you survived. He knew that all the people around me did not. The second stage is going to be anger. You're going to get mad at whoever might be responsible for the crash. Stage three, he said, is going to be listlessness, where things that used to have meaning in your life, like your family, your job, your spiritual convictions, which I didn't have any at that time, but uh, they wouldn't mean as much to you. And stage four, he said, will be depression. He said 99% of the people came out of your crash alive will suffer those four symptoms of post-trauma stress. But just know, he told me, they're a natural consequence of what you went through and you can work through them. And I had trouble, a lot of trouble working through those four things. For a long time after that plane crash, I really wrestled with why. Why did it happen? Why was I on board? Why was I sitting in the seat that I was? And I could never get an answer. And then I started kind of retracing steps and realizing that maybe a higher power, and I know that that's God, I didn't feel that at the time, um, maybe put me in that plane, in that particular seat, that particular time for a reason. And that was to maybe grab the little girl that I went back in the, the plane to get or help some other people out the back of the plane or maybe keep somebody from panicking and fleeing the plane when they should not have in the aftermath of the crash. So I look back on it now and I, I get some of those whys answered. Not all of them, but I get some of them answered because I think of my relationship with God, my faith in Christ and uh, doing God's will is the number one priority in my life. My family comes after that. So to me, my Christian faith is number one, it's everything, and I can speak for my wife when I say that too. There came to a point where I felt like there was a reason that I went through this experience, this plane crash, and I wanted to, to figure that out and then put that into action. So I started finding and executing those things, like talking about it and doing motivational speaking and speaking at churches about the spiritual convictions that I found after the, the crash and because of the crash. The book came about almost by accident. I started writing a journal and I looked at the journal one day and it looked like a book and I had been approached by some publishers to write a book and I never really wanted to do it but I felt like maybe now I had a message that there is hope after tragedy. You can still triumph, you can still realize your dreams, you can still fly, you can have a normal life again and, and have a great life again after tragedy. So that was one of the reasons I wrote the book and the reaction of the book over the years has been, has been tremendous and I, I think the, not only just writing a book, but being completely vulnerable in that book. Being honest about every emotion I felt and why I felt I had that emotion, which to me, looking back on it now, was post-trauma stress disorder. That, that's what it was. It was me going through that stage or those stages of PTSD and working through them and now looking back and going, I want to use that to help other people that are going through PTSD. I discovered that I enjoyed cycling a lot more than I thought I did. 
Before the plane crash, I was a cyclist and I did triathlons, but after the plane crash, I got back on a bike again and I realized it was great therapy. I don't know what it is, it's, it's the speed, it's the exhilaration, it's the sweat. It makes me feel alive again. And if I can do that and combine it with trying to help other people through cycling and raising money and awareness in these, these different ventures, then I gotta hold on to that and keep, keep riding as long as I got my heart pumping. I remember thinking, all right, let's break this race into pieces, and the first piece was from the Utah border to Grand Junction. So I was there, I think, less than two hours to begin. And it was dark, uh, there was some traffic. I remember just thinking, all right, don't get lost. Don't take a wrong turn, follow the, uh, the traffic signals, and just get through the town safely. I think as a cyclist and you're riding through the dark, sun comes up, it's a, it's a positive thing. My thought was, this is not the only time you're gonna be doing this. You're gonna have to do this tomorrow morning as well. So, and I started thinking what might happen between now and the next morning. I mean, I got 24 hours here to be on this bike before the sun comes up again, but I enjoyed it. It was good to have some light and see my surroundings a little better. on the way to Montrose and got the flat tire. There was a bunch of glass on the road and he did get a, a flat. I got a flat tire on that one. I remember thinking to myself that I have new tires, they're supposed to be puncture proof and I've got a flat tire already. Let's hope this is the only time that it happens. We've switched out bikes. You use the other bike while we uh, fix the flat. Instead of changing the tire out, we just changed bikes. I got on a different bike and, and took off. I didn't think much about that flat tire again. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> but then it flatted again, so we actually stopped in Gunnison. Uh, I called a, a bike shop in advance, these great guys at Double Shot Bikes, and said, hey, we're, we're on this race. Could you fix a quick tire for us? We rolled in uh, with the bike. They switched out the back tire, and uh, they're just great guys. And it's kind of neat to meet people like that along the way that not just our immediate crew, but people that are really invested and, and really want to help people succeed at a challenge like this. For any kind of race like this, you have to have a great crew. There's no getting around that. That's what really makes a race a lot of times, and you're only as good as your crew, and we had a tremendous one. Jerry calls me a crew chief, but I'm not certain what that means other than I've helped him get stuff organized, help kind of get a, a schedule and a flow of things during the race. I was so excited my wife was there, number one. She had uh, really never done an official race like this with me before. Just a good group of people. I knew that they would be very supportive. We've got a great crew of folks that are really attentive to what he's needing at any point and kind of how he's feeling. Hey, Jer. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. <laughs> been in the mountains a million times living in Colorado for 30 years but I never get tired of them and on a bike especially you have more time to observe and I just remember pedaling along it's slightly uphill but it's not the grueling part of the race thinking this is really fun the scenery here is good I'm feeling good the weather's good and I really enjoyed a couple hours there before I had to really start climbing. I like going through those little towns is fun. It breaks up the race is what it really does. And then when you get to that next town, like Delta in this case and Montrose and some others, you're just like, all right, well, here's the next stop. And you can slow down a little bit and observe some people and a little bit of crowd. You might look for a crew member or something. So it, it's fun going through those places. First cheer zone was cool. I, I didn't really think about the cheer zone a whole lot. I, I'm thinking about Montrose is my next stop in my head where I think I got to take a left turn to go toward Gunnison. When I took that left turn, came across the, the street there and saw everybody, it was, it was really cool. 
not only to see everybody, but because there were dogs there and there were veterans there and got off my bike and, and was able to catch my breath and just kind of hang with the veterans and their dogs, which is what this whole thing was about anyway. So it kind of reinforced the idea that I'm doing this for a particular reason and, and this is the reason I'm doing it. Thanks right. guys. Okay. See you soon. Yeah. Yeah. All right. This crazy bike race called Venture for Veterans is for a reason. It's not just for Jerry Schimmel to try to break a record uh, riding across the state of Colorado. It's uh, to benefit a, a group, a charity called Paws for Purple Hearts. And I was introduced to this charity by a good friend of mine who's worked with them before. And I just remember him saying, uh, I got a veterans group that you can do this benefit for, and they do incredible work. Paws for Purple Hearts was founded in 2011 as a nonprofit 501c3. Pause for Purple Hearts is very unique. We ultimately do train service dogs for wounded veterans, those who are suffering primarily from mobility issues. But in doing so, we actually utilize veterans who are suffering from post-traumatic stress or traumatic brain injury to train those dogs in the initial two years. They're training the young puppies from that early age, and then two years later, uh, that dog should be about ready for its service dog life. Therefore, we're getting about 50 veterans in contact with every service dog prior to it going to a single veteran for the remainder of its service life. Pause for Purple Hearts is a well-organized, well-oiled machine that is getting the job done. And the job they're in is to find the right breeding, the right dogs to provide a healing companion for veterans. When I first heard about the program, obviously I was um, really excited to be in it. And you know, I put in a lot of time. When I'm working with the puppies, I feel calm. I feel relaxed. I feel love. If we understand why so many veterans are so in love with their dogs, uh, it may tell us more about veterans. It may open up other avenues of treatment. I am amazed every day by the gains that my clients make and how fast they make them when working with canines. You can learn from them in numerous ways. In a sense, they're really helping you uh, when you're not even realizing it. Working with the puppies and knowing that they're going to be future service dogs to fellow service members brings great pride to me. I feel like I'm at service to my country and my brothers at arms. There's no question that Paws for Purple Hearts has an important role to play uh, moving forward, uh, learning more about this both in the clinical realm and in the scientific realm. Pause for Purple Hearts is a national nonprofit. We currently have five facilities. Our goal is to grow to 30 ultimately, in which we believe we'd be able to cover 70 to maybe 80 percent of the country within about 100 miles or a two hour drive of one of our uh, locations. Well, in order to achieve the sort of growth that we would like, we're gonna to need to continue to rely upon donations from individuals, uh, donations from grants and foundations, as well as corporate sponsorships. Paws for Purple Hearts is a wonderful organization. It's something that you should consider giving money to. It's an amazing organization. They have changed my life in ways that I can't even begin to describe. They are doing work that is saving lives. They're saving lives of veterans every single day. And that's a, not a profound statement, it's a fact. I said, I wanna be part of that. That means riding my bike across Colorado uh, in wind and rain and cold, I'm, I'm gonna do that. Jerry now rides for us to help veterans. He found a way to work through his post-traumatic stress, through exercise and a very spiritual life. However, he knows that combat veterans go through even more. They volunteered for what they had to experience. So that's why Jerry is so dedicated and we're very eager to see him work through his post-traumatic stress and help a lot of veterans along the way. There's a lot of people say, well, you survived the plane crash so you can identify with these veterans. And you know what, to be honest, I, I really don't think that I can. 
And I got labeled a hero coming out of this, this plane crash because I went back in and grabbed this little girl. And I'll be as honest as I can be, that hero tag never felt right. Because I didn't weigh a risk. I didn't think it through and do it anyway. It all just sort of happened, and it happened very quickly. Our vets are different. They're heroes in my mind because they know what's at stake. To me, if you want to start with a hero, you start with our military personnel. Highway 50 across Colorado is really interesting to me because you get about everything. Kind of forgotten a little bit of the rural feel of western Colorado. There's uh, orchards and farmland and some trees but, but not a whole lot and, until you get up in the mountains there, there aren't a lot of uh, rugged looking peaks or anything like that so I thought that was kind of cool. I kind of forgotten what western Colorado is about because when people think western slope you're thinking all right well there's just more mountains out there but really is not the case especially closer to the area of Grand Junction. It was a stretch about 30 miles out of Montrose started climbing right away where it was hard and then there was a headwind and it started getting warm as well so that was a really tough challenge probably about two and a half hours or I was really struggling, slowed way down, lost my pace, going uphill against wind with heat, not a great combination. But I finally kind of made it up there in road construction. I had gone through road construction many times and you can usually kind of skirt it, you can get through it somehow, cheat a little bit, what, whatever it takes. I couldn't. I was stopped two different times and uh, I could not go forward. In fact, I tried to cheat one time and they yelled at me and honked at me and made me come back <laughs> to where I was and get, not only that, but get in the back of the line. So um, it was nice to stop for a moment, catch my breath, but I wasn't anticipating losing 20 or 25 minutes with road construction. Yeah, dropping down into Blue Mesa Reservoir area was really cool. I'm thinking, this is a big lake. It's the biggest reservoir in Colorado, I think. It was fun though, because you got the race broken up a little bit. You got water and you're going over bridges and it was a little bit up and down, which I didn't anticipate, but it was a lot of fun at the same time. On rides like this, Jerry needs about 600 calories per hour. I try to give him a lot of high protein foods and just constantly eating a small amount throughout the ride. To stay supplied with drink and with, uh, with food is a challenge. You get out in the middle of the mountains and you're riding three or four hours, the last thing you want to do is eat. You're not hungry. Let's make him eat something here, okay? He basically will not eat or drink unless we really encourage him to do it because he doesn't feel like it. And nothing tastes good. Nothing sounds good or tastes good, so it's hard to get enough nutrition sometimes. That's a challenge. It's really hard when these guys are going all out to encourage them to keep eating because it's not just eating for right now, it's eating for, you know, 100 miles down the road. I've been eating. I had two Cliff Bars and a bag of peanuts already. Okay. I, yeah, and every time you take a drink, I'm like, me. yes! <laughs> If you start getting behind, if Jerry's not getting the nutrition he needs, both in, you know, in liquid form and in terms of food that he's eating, if he's not doing it now, it's definitely going to catch up with him later and his, his body just won't have the fuel it needs to keep going. I made tuna wraps, a couple different flavors of tuna wraps, bananas, and he just ate a half of filet -O fish sandwich. Like in two hours, we regroup again, take a sandwich. Okay. He's been eating lots of hard-boiled eggs today, a lot. I made two dozen, and I think we're down to a dozen. I was really anticipating coming into Gunnison for a couple reasons. One, I was exhausted. <laughs> I felt like I needed a little break, catch my breath, get off my bike for a little bit. But I knew there would be a cheer zone there. And I got there and it was, it was really neat. Not just the people that I knew would be there, but some other veterans in the area had been invited to come out. And some other dogs were there. A reporter from the local newspaper was there. That was all kind of a pleasant surprise. That was really fun to get off the bike and, and kind of converse with those people. 
now I need to rest just a little bit because I got Monarch Pass coming up here sometime soon. And I remember just uh, getting something to eat, something to drink, talked to my wife a little bit, and then I laid on the grass next to that park just for, I don't think I fell asleep, but I laid down there for a few minutes just to sort of regroup physically and mentally and emotionally, and I think it really helped me. I knew that I was going to hit some weather at some point in this ride, inevitable. You're going to do that going through the mountains. And then I'm taking off out of Gunnison toward Monarch Pass, and there it was. There were the dark clouds looming in front of me. I was in from October of 1990 through December of 1999, so a little bit under 10 years, and did the Gulf War, Somalia, Bosnia, Korea. My accident happened while we were actually doing night maneuvers for training exercise, getting ready for Desert Storm. I came to no pause for Purple Hearts when I went to Bergen University for Canine Studies to receive a dog. They had three different dogs that they placed with me every day. When Major came out and I saw that he was mine, it was, it was amazing. It, it really was. He could tell what, what was going on with me beforehand and it's, it was just amazing to see that he'd already picked up on all of that stuff. Major actually picked me. He's the one that made the decision, I think. Major changes my life every day. I mean, he's there to pick me up when I actually fall. He's there to help me get off the ground. He will retrieve everything that I ask him to retrieve for me if I need it. He is actually pulling me up stairs and guiding me downstairs so that I'm not falling. He's a very big stabilizing force. He's really a brace, not just for me, but also for my wife, Roberta. And together they both keep me focused and grounded, I guess you could say. I'm not in my depression as long and as deep as I used to be. You know, it would be days or weeks that I would be in my depression because I'm in so much pain. But with Major, he makes me come out of it. He makes me go out and do things so that I can't stay focused on the pain. I have to focus on something else. Major means the world to my family. Major is way more than just working service dog. He's part of the family. He is another child, I guess you can say, is the easiest word. One that actually has a job to do that, that he does well and enjoys doing. It is so hard to imagine my life without Major. It's, I look back to when I didn't have him and just all the things that were going on and how hectic and anxiety filled my life was before I got him. So, so no, I can't imagine it without him. You know, I saw those dark clouds and I thought, it's inevitable, here comes the rain, and then it hit. And it was heavy. I mean, it was big drop. I remember it, the drops being so big, and I guess maybe that's made it seem like it was heavier than it was, but I'm thinking, all right, the, the rain is hit, and the rain is hit with vengeance now on my way to Monarch Pass. The follow vehicle pulled up next to me in the rain and, and told me they had trouble seeing me because it was dark and it was raining. And they said, we'd like to change your tail light out. And so I stopped and let them do that. I remember <laughs> sitting in the foul vehicle and watching them get soaked while they were <laughs> fixing the light on my bike and thinking, well, number one, I'm staying dry. Number two, these guys are awesome. It, it just, it hit me again how important the crew was and how good, especially my crew was on this race. Well, this might sound a little crazy, but I was always looking forward to Monarch Pass. I've ridden it a couple times and I wanted to do it again. I always felt like I was a strong climber and so I was looking forward to it. I wasn't ready for how depleted I was when I went up it and I struggled. Anytime you ride nine miles up a mountain at a 7% grade to get to 12,000 feet almost, it's going to be a challenge. 
The weather was fine. That, that wasn't a problem. There was no wind. There was, the rain had stopped. But I just wasn't feeling good. I had already ridden almost 200 miles, I think, and I'm thinking, wow, this turns what I thought was going to be a lot of fun into a real challenge physically. I do remember the last couple miles before I got up there thinking, because I had the back of my mind I might have to stop. I wasn't feeling very good on the way up Mount Arc, and I thought, now just get the next mile marker, and then if you feel okay, just keep going. I remember the last three thinking, no, you can make it the top. So I got the top, and I was struggling. There, there was no question about it. Not necessarily because I had just ridden up Monarch Pass uh, and gone 3,000 feet plus, but just the whole day. I mean, it was starting to get dark again, and I thought, eh, I've been on my bike all day long. I'm exhausted here. I figured when I got to the top of Monarch Pass that I'd have to stop and do some things, like take pictures with people and talk to some others. And so I figured, all right, let's just use it an opportunity to catch your breath, to kind of regroup a little bit physically and mentally. And I think that, that helped a little bit. I went back in the RV and I'm going to get something to eat. And then I, I drank a little something. And then I told my wife, I'm just going to I'm gonna sleep here. Wake me up in five minutes. And then my wife woke me up. 10 minutes later, so she didn't follow instructions, but she let me sleep for 10 minutes and it felt great. When I started up again, I remember thinking to myself, be careful, because this is downhill, it's getting dark, the weather's not great, it had been raining a little bit, the, the roads were wet, and I thought number one right now is not speed, it is safety. But then, yeah, we go into the Arkansas Canyon, like between Salida and almost to Canyon City, really narrow roads it's going to be in the dark um, you know so even for somebody that's kind of physically at the top of their game and not that Jerry won't be but he's been riding hundreds of miles already it's going to be a challenge to get him through there uh, at a good pace and uh, kind of keep everyone safe along the way. Monster is Jason's service dog. He is able to get out into the community with him on a daily basis. He truly provides Jason stability um, and mostly he gets him out uh, making him feel safe, being able to focus more on the dog than on the surroundings. The thing I've discovered with Jethro because originally he was just supposed to wake me up when I had nightmares but since he actually barks when people walk by the house and things I've actually discovered that just having him around makes me feel safe enough that I really don't have the nightmares all that often anymore. So I'm going to say out of everything, that's probably the best thing he does for me is just make me feel more confident. Friends come and go, but a dog, they stay with you for life. No matter what, he's, he's always there for me. He means a world to me. Without the dog, Jason was unable to leave the house without me. When we're in difficult, stressful environments such as crowds, uh, stadiums, arenas, he will really focus on the dog. You'll see them face to face, him talking to the dog. The dog really pays attention to him at that point and knows that he's really needed. I can't speak for other veterans, but I know for me, when I'm in a dark area and you don't feel like you know, being touchy and feely, the dog senses that. He, he knows, you know, hey, wait a minute, you know, he's, he's not into it. If I stare out in space and I start having like a flashback, uh, evidently he knows because he starts licking me. People are more forgiving about my character flaws, I guess, when I have the dogs around. It like lets people know that there's a reason why I'm behaving the way I am, and it makes people more accepting and more tolerant of my eccentricities, I guess you'd say. They're calm, uh, they're very loving, and when you tell them to do something, most of the time, they do it. They're just amazing. They help, they've done more for me than anything, period. I mean, more than the medications or anything else. The, dogs really helped a lot.
There are challenges riding at night, no getting around that. Number one is visibility. You have a car behind you and you have headlights and you have your own light, but there's still things you can't see. And the biggest challenge, I, I think, riding in the dark is not seeing potholes, not seeing stuff that you're going to ride over that, that might cause you to crash or get a flat tire or something like that. You can't see the pavement in front of you very well. That's the dangerous part about night riding. My stomach started hurting right outside of Canyon City. And there's a slope up into Kansas City for a couple miles. And we're thinking, this is the worst timing because I'm not feeling very good. Now I got to go uphill for a couple miles. And once I started the exertion of going uphill, my stomach felt better rather than worse. Yeah, that second sunrise was different. I knew that when the sun came up on the second day, I was getting out in the plains of eastern Colorado and I was getting near the finish line and that kind of revived me a little bit. Not just the sun coming up, the light shining again, but the fact that I was getting near the end. Once I got through the mountains and through Pueblo and the sun came up, then I think the lack of sleep really started to, to take effect with me. I told my crew, I said, if I start getting sleepy, if I start falling asleep on a bike, which I've actually done before, that I would let them know. I did that a couple of different times, and a couple other times, the file vehicle pulled up next to me or asked me to stop just to make sure that I was okay. So they were very cognizant of, of what I was doing and what I was feeling in terms of lack of sleep. I took some caffeine and it, it helped at the beginning. I'm thinking, I don't want to stop, I don't want to sleep, but I'm probably going to have to in the long run, it'll be the best thing. So I stopped a couple of times and took some very quick naps. Yeah, yeah. I'm afraid I'm not going to get the record because I take too many power naps. When you're out there on your bike that long and you get to that point in the race where you still got several hours to go but you can see the finish line, there's just a myriad of thoughts that go through your mind. I thought about the crew. I didn't want to let them down. I started thinking about veterans. I thought about my late brother-in-law who, who died as a result of injuries in Vietnam uh, when he served there. I thought about my wife and she had very little sleep. He's driving this RV across the state of Colorado. I just thought about everything. I, I thought about veterans, I thought about my body, I thought about crew, friends, family. You got lots of time to think and that's what I did. My late father told me one time when we were talking about the effects of the plane crash and he was a World War II veteran and he saw a lot of stuff in the European front and he said, you know what Jerry, you just need to keep moving. And I thought, wow, that, that's that's pretty good advice from dad. Maybe one of the better pieces of advice my dad ever gave me. Just keep moving. So what does that mean? I think it means you, you don't sit around and, and wallow in self-pity, which I did. Uh, you don't sit around and watch TV and hope things get better, which I did. You, you take action. You, you get up out of that chair and you do something. And like dad said, you just keep moving. You find what moving means and you just keep doing it. It might lead to something else. For me, it was to get on a bike and start riding. And it, I never really looked back after taking that advice and getting back on my two wheels. The relationship between a dog and a veteran is amazingly personal and very heartwarming as well. For me, the moment came when I was at Arlington National Cemetery. We were just taking some photos. Um, something occurred where I saw a veteran sitting alone on a bench and I, I knew that I was supposed to pay attention for whatever reason. As we were leaving the, the uh, cemetery, it was closing time and the groundskeeper trying to hurry everybody out. I wanted to shuffle all the dogs and the photographers and uh, everybody and this in, in particular individual was still there alone uh, with his head down. I immediately turned around and ran back. There was no soul in him. His eyes looked through me as, as if I wasn't there. But this individual had performed uh, heroically in combat. It was 
uh, 12 years after his combat in Iraq, and he had been wounded twice in the battle, but his friends didn't make it out. He was trying to come back and visit them. Uh, he was so despondent as to have demonstrated everything called a suicidal ideation. And I was so concerned about it that I was physically trying to check him for a weapon. I was able to convince him to come out and meet the dogs. I brought him to the dogs and he dropped to his knees and he embraced uh, a nine-month-old golden retriever by the name of Patsy. And Patsy intuitively knew what she was doing. And as he put a grip on her that most dogs would have squirmed out of, um, she just put her head up into his neck and on his shoulders. And a uh, outpouring of emotions, tears, pain uh, for all the years that it had been there. It came out of him. And that dog absorbed it like a sponge. It didn't matter to her. She just knew. She just knew that he needed help. And where I couldn't reach him, she did. And after half an hour of this powerful scene unfolding, as all of us who witnessed it stood very reverently, we noticed that he'd come back where I'd not seen his spirit, his soul. He popped up, wiped away the tears and, the, and his eyes, and, and he, he looked me square in the eye and he said, I'm okay now. And I knew he meant it. I got to see his soul had returned. And he was no longer despondent. He no longer felt like a failure. His problem was what many veterans has. He lived. He survived when his friends didn't. He felt like he was a failure because he couldn't make another step into the cemetery to visit their graves. His friends knew, his buddies knew that he had done it. He just needed somebody to approve of it. And it couldn't come from me. It couldn't come from any other human, but a nine month old golden retriever changed his life. The final probably 15 or 20 miles, I do remember thinking about specific things. I remember thinking number one, don't blow up. You only got an hour to go here. You know, don't go run out of water, keep drinking, you know, just don't don't bonk at this point. Finish this race because you're there. That was my first priority. Then I really started thinking about the veterans and I thought about what they have gone through. Not just the family members that I have there in the military, but others that I know stories I read about and see. I just thought, I, I honestly did, I, I thought about and got inspired by veterans and what they might now be going through as well in their transition. And if they can sacrifice uh, their lives to try to help mine, I can do a little bit more to finish this bike race. Yeah, baby. Carrying the flag was really cool. To be honest, when I grabbed it, when I first started riding with it in my hand and finally figured out how I could carry it and not crash at the same time, I really got emotional. I, I really did. I thought, I'm carrying an American flag uh, to the finish line of a 468 mile race for veterans. This is really cool. And I, I shed a few tears on my bike, to be honest. I do remember thinking, man, I just did 468 miles. That's pretty good stuff. I mean, no one can take this away from me. I don't care what time I finished. I finished, and I did this race across Colorado, so I'm always going to have that. The people that were around there, my wife came up and hugged me. That was really cool. The crew members, the production crew was there. I mean, it was all kind of coming together as a little bit of relief, a little bit of celebration, and probably a lot of pride. I missed that overall record by less than an hour, so I mean, I, I came close. To be within an hour was, was fine with me. Setting an age group record was cool. 
I think I broke that record by several hours, which is great. Um, but I just kept telling myself, all right, you don't have this record, but you still did this and you did it the right way. You did it for the right reasons. It was really cool taking those pictures of the crew because I had thought about that. I knew where that Kansas border sign was and then we'd take pictures in front of it and I kind of daydreamed about that a lot during the ride. I mean, even at the beginning of the race, I, I thought about that. I don't know whose idea it was, but somebody said, at least pick Jerry up and we'll hold him. And totally symbolic to me, looking back at that photo, that here was a crew that had supported me and picked me up this whole race for 33 hours, and now they're doing it at the end. It was, it was a perfect setting and the perfect way to end that race. I look back on it now, and I, I feel very good, to be honest, about helping out veterans. I, I never served, and um, I always kind of regretted that because I have family members who served. And I thought, well, if I'm not going to be a veteran, maybe I can do something to help those veterans. And looking back on that race, I, th I think I did that. It wasn't just a race. It wasn't just a haphazard thing. It was a full-out effort by a lot of people and a great team. And we got the job done. I mean, that's what I think about now. I was told that Paws of Purple Hearts was a great organization with great leadership. I never realized how great they were. Paws of Purple Hearts is a group that is invested in veterans, doing their part to help the veterans who come back from war. Their motivation is pure. Their energy for veterans is right and it's truthful. And I enjoyed every minute with this group. Paws of Purple Hearts is great. Jerry, thank you so much for what you're doing and it is so awesome to see that people are taking and caring that much about other people and organizations that help and that there's goodness out there and they're honestly loving and caring people. Thank you, Jerry. Hey Jerry, I want to thank you for what you're doing for Pause for Purple Hearts. I was a broadcaster in the United States Air Force, so I know the, uh, the influence you have in the community. So I want to thank you for uh, using that influence you have to tell the people of Colorado and the entire world about the great things that Pause for Purple Hearts is doing for veterans. So thank you very much. Jerry, I just want to thank you personally for everything you've done for Pause for Purple Hearts and the veterans in our programs, and for veterans in general. Uh, you're a tremendous individual, one with courage and fortitude. Uh, you've demonstrated that at times, and I know you're very humble and modest about it. Nonetheless, what you've done for our veterans, which are now in the thousands, is very hard for me to put into words, but thank you so much for everything you've done. Mm -hmm.